find everything interesting. There's a lot to be interested in. If, you're, if you get into psychology and economics and physics, and there's so much going on, I said to a friend of mine, boy, there's no reason to be bored. You know, <laughs> there's so much going on. Imagine people being bored. But uh, economics, I think, is really something that has to be dealt with. And uh, welcome. Welcome very much to Conversations, where it's a pleasure to welcome to the, pro to the pro program uh, Professor Robert Heilbronner, who really needs no introduction, I should think, to most of the audience viewing. He's the uh, economic philosopher. He's the author of the famous, I think it's fair to say, famous uh, on an international scale uh, book, uh, The Worldly Philosophers. And we're here to talk about that and other matters. And uh, Professor Heilbronner, welcome very, very much to Conversations and Manhattan Network. And thank you for all those nice words. No, it's all truly <laughs> heartfelt, right, in any case. I've been in touch with you, and you have this uh, book. I wonder, we have some time. Maybe you could share a little of your own background, uh, your academic or personal background. And then we can get into this book that was published, you know, some years ago yeah. and has become a standard work in the, in the intellectual community of the world. But share a little of your own background and we could talk about the... I went to college in 19... God knows when. 1920, I think it was. Yes. And I went through what I study. I didn't know what to study, so right. I did fine arts. I love right. fine arts. I did right. philosophy. I love philosophy. Right. I did... I did bio, uh, biology. Yes. I almost learned biology. It's all interesting. I did history. I loved history. I didn't do any economics. Uh -huh. In my second year, I got mm -hmm. going for the first time mm -hmm. with a wonderful old Russian, ex-Russian, not quite noble man, man of quite great noblesse, mm -hmm. Vasily Leontiev. Oh, yes. He just passed. I yes, I know. I know. I know. Sad passed. And we, yes. he read us as our textbook, yes. a book by Alfred Marshall, published in 1890. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's older than we were. Yes. And he would say things like, when prices crease, the yes. men creases. <laughs> and after the class, we would say, increase, decrease, <laughs> ink or deke. Yeah. But uh, I went through Harvard. Yes. And I did economics, did more economics. And since I said, uh, in truth, I, I did very well. I was, I was the head of my class. Yes, I'm good for I you. I didn't yeah. know any economics at all. Yeah. Somehow, I was good at the exams. Uh -huh. I'd learned what I had to read. But I, had yeah. I read Adam Smith? No. No. Had I had read David Ricardo? Who? Huh? Had I read Karl Marx? Well, I'd read the Communist Manifesto. How about the rest? What do you mean, the rest? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that having had a degree uh, in economics from Harvard, was well, your degree I, in economics? I, I, or learned, I learned the stuff, yes, uh -huh. which was the sort of textbook stuff. Yes. And that wonderful man, John Maynard Keynes, brought out his remarkable book, yes. The General Theory, uh -huh. which is about how the economy goes up and down, not just back and forth. Yeah. Up, up at that time, the, the economy was regarded as a kind of this, this kind of mechanism, yeah. a little too much that way, a little too much this way. Right. They were called markets, and right. they, they balanced. Yeah. John Maynard Keynes said, doesn't go this way, it goes this way. Yes, right, right. <laughs> and, and that's the only thing, in a manner of speaking, I exaggerate, but not entirely that I learned. But you were at Harvard when you heard uh, Joseph Schumpeter give his talk about the Depression is like a good cold douche. I did, I did, <laughs> and, and I didn't know that that word douche was yeah. a European word for shower. Shower, yes. We, right. was, we thought it was um, something yeah. else. Yeah, oh, right, 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 right. And then, you know, I came and then I came out, out, out of the, had no idea what to do. My yeah. father had died when I was very young. He'd been a very successful businessman. I thought I'd go into business. Yeah. And I was about to, when I went to a concert one day with a friend of mine. At the end of the concert, a man comes out, holds up his hand, asks for the shh. There was shh. And he said, I regret to state folks, but while we've been listening to the whatever it was, mm -hmm. the Japanese have bombed for a while. Wow, December 7th. Huh? Yeah. So I knew I wasn't going to go to business. Right, and yeah. the next, within two days, I was on a train to Washington. Through some connections I had at, 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 at college, I went right away to see the people who were running the Office of Price Administration. And within three days, I was working as an economist. I see. And I began to understand economics. Yeah. For the first time, it's uh -huh. so hard to believe this, uh -huh. all the textbooks I read, all the stuff I read, and it wasn't just me. I did after what was called well. Yes. We hadn't linked it to, what, to, to the real world out there. It uh -huh. was just stuff in books. Yeah. It wasn't things out there in the world. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And so I got interested in economics. Then, believe it or not, I got sent to a Japanese school to learn Japanese because I was good in languages. I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So you did. You learned Japanese. I learned right damn right. I learned. Oh, I, I was a year and a half yeah. in the states. Then uh -huh. I went into the army. Uh -huh. And first thing, and a long trip in clothes portholes going towards the Pacific. Mm -hmm. First place we stopped was New Guinea. I'd never seen anything like New Guinea. Right, I, I, I stood on the desk Those on the deck and I said to myself, thank God I'm not getting off here. My neck goes over the loudspeaker. I am getting off there. Yes. And I had the great good luck to sort of wait for till my assignment came through. I met an Australian trade trader, I mean mm -hmm. a, a local trader. And he, we got friendly and he said to me, Bob, come on, let's go, go out and take a look. 
I get in front of the jeep, we go down as far as the roads were taken, five miles no more road, stop the jeep, go through the jungle, my first jungle, mm -hmm. cross the bridge, bridge, mm -hmm. the, the fallen log, yeah. up a little escarpment, there on top of the first primitive, primitive, hate the word, hunting and gathering people I've ever seen. And here was- This is New Guinea now. Yeah, New yes. Guinea. Here was my friend carrying half dozen blankets folded up like this. Right. He put them down there. Uh -huh. There was a man with the bones in his nose right. and, the, and, and the odd <laughs> yes. stones. He put them down here. Yeah. And we didn't speak the language, yeah. but he or, or my friend would mm. put say, one blanket and those things, mm. and we would look at each other and say, oh, trade. Well, if it was, trade was made. Right. Right. So market, I right. had my yeah. first yeah. funny, I mean, that yeah. doesn't sound like economics, Not does at all. it? Yeah, it is. But I got a, a feeling of, God damn, yeah. that's the way man, mankind used to trade things. Yeah, did you begin to get the idea for the worldly philosophy? Whoa, no. no. Okay, I didn't want to jump the gun, but. But I, I, got, yeah. I got interested in, in, in economic in a deep way. Yeah. I mean, as part of re real life. In a personal, in a personal quest kind of real intellectual curiosity kind of way. Th th yeah. That economics was an attempt to explain life. Yes, all right. Like my trading with you with no, right. with no money no, no, right. and no yeah. language. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I learned to speak Japanese. I went through the war and I interrogated a Japanese person. And mm -hmm. when I opened my mouth and out came Japanese, mm -hmm. first thing I said was, Shinpai Shinaida, all your le leaders would know it means, don't, don't get worried. Mm -hmm. And this enormous look of relief came yes. over my poor soldier's face. Yeah. He knew he wasn't going to be shot. And I went through and I interrogated 2,000 persons. It's very hard for me to, to say these things, yes. to believe them, but yeah. I did. And when I came back and I was out of the army and safe and sound, thank God. Yeah. I knew I had to, I wasn't going to go into business, I wasn't going to go into Japanese, yes. but I was going to go into economics. Yeah, and you had done your undergraduate at Harvard then, is that it? And you I, done my, I done, yeah, undergraduate at Harvard. Yeah. And graduate. And what did that no. degree come out in? Was that history? Economics. Economic? It was economics. Econo okay, econo right. Okay, absolutely. right. Okay, okay. And yeah. then you, you, you're associated because you're there now with the New School. Yeah, well, Did you I, take up with the New School then? then or? There was something in, in New York, yeah. which was not very well known in those days, it was called the New School. Yes. And it was run by there. It was started way back by Thorstein Veblen and John James Harvey Robinson, the, the professor of American I hadn't history. Veblen oh, was involved. 1918. Yeah, okay. uh -huh. And it, it went along all right and taught adults. And I don't think it gave credits. Who knows what it did? But anyway, right. uh, when, when the war broke out, mm -hmm. a couple of very socially minded and thank God well to do trustees decided one of the things they could do before the war really broke out was to rescue some of the professors who were sure as hell going to be caught under the wheel of the fascists of Hitler. Yes. And he went abroad with a few, I don't know how many thousands of dollars, and picked up this professor and that professor and that professorette, uh -huh. and put together a faculty which was called the University in Exile. Perfect name. That's what it had grown out of. Yep. I the didn't realize that, really. Yeah. And I went there. Yeah, a lot of talent was in Exile, oh, it was wasn't one, it, though? Uh, you know, and, amazing. And the yeah. spirit, yeah. you don't know what the spirit was like. Yeah. And the German professordom. Yeah. And that's when I began learning Japanese, because for the first time, him the man said, I mean, I won't do the accent, well, now if you begin now, if it's Adam Schmidt. Yes. <laughs> he, he has not, he, he, who has not read Adam Schmidt? <laughs> Every, nobody read Adam Schmidt. So we read that fascinating book. Yeah. And yeah. then we read other books and other books. And, and finally he said to me, you know, I said to him one day, I had to make my living somehow. Yeah. I made my living as a freelance writer. Right. Uh, somehow, become a writer. Yeah. I don't know how you become a writer. Right. And I wrote about this and wrote about that. I went to a magazine, a woman's magazine, Castle Publishing, and they yeah. said, Bob, I'd like you to write a piece about Monroe. I thought they meant President Monroe, which yeah. struck me as very odd because it was, of course, Marilyn Monroe. Oh, Marilyn. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I wrote, a, I wrote a piece about the right Monroe, and then I went back to see my professor, and I said to him, I said, his name was Adolf Lowe, Lola. Mm -hmm. It took me 10 years to call him out of. I said, Professor Lova, yeah. uh, I've decided I'd like to write a book about these wonderful people. Yes, right. And he said, he had a, he, standing this way, instead of standing this way, he yeah. stood this way. <laughs> yes, a Kimbo. <laughs> huh? This yes. way. Well, <laughs> and he said to me uh, with his wonderful accent, yeah. and he was already very nice, so he yes. said, Bob, Bob. That, that you cannot do. Yeah. I said, yes, okay. Yeah. And I went home and continued freelancing. Did he uh, round that out? Why no, you cannot? No, no, no. That you cannot. That you cannot. That you cannot. Period. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way he was right, I didn't know enough. Yeah. And I went back and oh. I worked hard. And, and three months later, I brought three chapters. And after the class, I asked permission if he would read them. This was the beginning of the worldly philosophy. Yeah. Oh. And next next lesson, next month, whatever it was, same class, same arms akimbo. Yeah. Bop after class, bop. He said, 
that you must do. Yes, okay. Well, you see, you do have a word way with words. It makes yeah. all the difference. Uh, yeah, and that was the beginning of it. That, that must have been it. coming into the 50s that then, was right? It. And, then, and then he worked. I mean, he was a lovely man. Yeah. Then every word I wrote, he mm -hmm. read. Uh -huh. And saved me from many an error, I believe me. Okay. You can imagine. Did he help you edit, do you think? Or? No, he no. was not, no. No, no. 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 Okay. I, I did the writing. Yeah. I did the editing. Uh -huh. I, I dreamed it up, so yeah. to speak. But he saved me from many a mistake. All right. Oh, he's wonderful. And that book is, we have only a dummy copy here. Yeah, but I I know. This is the seventh. Let's just show it for a minute. We should have the cover. We don't have the cover. It's, it's going to come out, I guess, in the summer of 99. But th it's called, it's a famous book that anyone who's in the, would be familiar with. It's called The Worldly Philosopher. This is just an advanced copy of the seventh edition, which is that. And it came out originally, The Worldly Philosopher, in what, 1953, 54? I think so, yeah. Something like <coughs> that. And you took it and you, and you had a piece in the preface, which is rather kind of funny and everything, that sort of thing, where you, the title of the book was sort of interesting. You got it because you're going to write on economics and the great economic thinkers. And you took it to somebody who was in the publishing world, and you said, I'm just thinking of a title. You knew economics was death at the box office, as they would say. But maybe you could share that with us a little bit. That's a funny well, the story man, to tell. The man you just talked about was a perfectly lovely man, Frederick Lewis Allen. And this is, excuse me, this is from the first edition? Yes, yes, yes this is right, back in 1952. Right. And he was, I, to, to make a living as a freelance writer, I wrote quite frequently for Harper's. Yeah. And on, on summers when, they, when help was low, he would hire me mm -hmm. as his, his assistant yeah. in the office. And yeah. I learned an awful lot under the aegis of this lovely guy. So we had lunch one day, and I'd done the book. He had read part of the book. He liked it very much. Yeah. And I said, Fred, I can't think of the damn title. Right. I mean, as I've written what, Did you have a working title, do you remember? Yeah. Well, well, what I, was the working title? No, I I no, no, no. The only thing I knew was yeah. I couldn't use the word economics. Yeah, because it's death, right? Yeah. Death at the box. It's office. the dismal. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I said to him, Fred, I can't. You say, I can't yeah. call it the great economist. Who might? Yeah. I call it the great, the great money economist. That's wrong. No, no, the great no, material economist. No, no, no. He said, Bob, you mean worldly. I said, and it's, you, it's the truth. It's in written in yeah, one of the letters. Said, oh, I said, Fred, I'll buy lunch. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and well, it, it's, it was yeah. it's a wonderful book. It is a perfect title, isn't it? I would that, never right? thought you, what you talk, And years. what it is, is a book uh, looking at the great economic thinkers and this whole discipline of what has become economics, which is so prevalent, so important now. And it's interesting, you bring it out through 99% of human history, you see, there was no such thing. And you see, worldly no. it means yeah. everybody. Well, well the, I don't even know what the exact meaning yeah. of worldly is, yeah. many meanings, but yeah. it really means of the world, yes. alive, mm -hmm. part of what you and I know and do. Right. Right. So, and that's ex that was exactly what I wanted to do in the book. I wanted to make these people come alive. Yes, and, and you certainly have, if I may say so. Yeah. And and I wanted, to, I wanted to make clear to people who would have been frightened away by economics, which everybody knows is terrifying, yeah. uh, to recognize this is going to be a, a book in which people talk about life. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to the store and buy something. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily when you go to the stock exchange. That comes later and yeah. much less important than people think. Uh -huh. Just how it hangs together, how yeah. it works. Yeah. It's worldly in that yeah. sense. Yeah, and that's right. Anyway, it went. Yeah, so and it did. And it's, went, and it's gone into seven editions now, and I think it's sold probably four to five million copies around the world, and dozens of languages have been translated. It's a basic primer that all people who are interested in this important subject uh, would go do well to repair to and have. I'll I would ask you right now to stop and knock wood on your chair, please. Yes, please, knock on wood and say the seventh edition even do better. <laughs> uh, and you've done it, and you've taken, you've got, you've got into chapters, and you begin with, in a certain sense, you, you first you have a survey of the human condition, and you point out that throughout, if I may, and you can fill it in, 99% uh, of the human experience, we probably had nothing that could be called economics until the time of Adam Smith, 1776, and that there was, uh, you know, command economy and that sort of thing in the day of but Pharaoh. Let me, let me but that's interesting. That's right, but yeah. let, me, let me put it a little differently. Yes, sir. For the first, 99%, uh, I don't know how many years Homo sapiens has been well, on this world. Well, they seem to say 200,000 now, the well, mitochondrial now. DNA well, people. Yeah. A hell of a long time. Yes. Of that hell of a long time, mm -hmm. for 99 percent, there was nothing that you and I would have called an economy. Right. But certainly, people got along. Sure. What an economy is about mm -hmm. is how you raise the food you eat yeah. and, and the clothes you wear. And maybe shared it out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so <laughs> that's part of it. Producing yeah. things yeah. and sharing things yes. uh -huh. is what it's about. Mm -hmm. How do people in hunting and gathering societies, of which we had an example in this country, American Indians, mm -hmm. I mean, the original ones. Yeah. Uh, they didn't, didn't have any money, they didn't have any stock exchange, they didn't have any... Uh, th they had, what, tradition? Mm -hmm. You do it the way your grandfather's done it. That's right. Kinship, yeah. mother and mother-in-law, I mean, uh, people had rankings, and that's how it, it was organized. When, when you went on a hunt, 
you hunted in the formation that your grandfather and great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather, of course, that's the one that has succeeded. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to take a risk with doing a different way of hunting and fail and not bring back the game. Because you were very close on the edge, for one thing, of yeah, just well, survival, yeah, maybe, you know, or You just didn't yeah. want to take the risk, and you yeah. and I wouldn't have either, honestly. Right. You know, if we mm -hmm. didn't know how to do it, who wants the risk? Yeah, let's so do, it do it the way, way we know works. we got to here. That's right. Well, let's keep doing it the way we have. And that's an interesting kind of experiment. That's it kind is, of an interesting uh, philosophical uh, perspective uh, on the human condition well, at any time. It's awfully maybe. useful to understand that. Yeah. And, and that, believe it or not, this business of running a society by doing it the way grandfather did it mm -hmm. is a kind of economics, okay. really. Yeah. It's economics, of tr I mean, economics, I mean, the way, of, the way you organize the society's putting itself together yeah. and feeding itself. Yeah. And their way is tradition, and it's worked for 99.99% of all time. Right. The and that probably, yeah, that might have included a great deal of other kinds well, of things you know, there that was it might be good for us to start thinking about things other uh, than <laughs> quantitative analysis and you, so forth. Yeah. You're not kidding. Yeah, that's a theme that you bring up. But, but you yes. know, the, uh, there was, of course, some break from tradition. I mean, people, some lucky person would discover maybe by chance by striking two stones together, you get a sharper edge on the right. stone. Yes. So you get flint heads mm -hmm. for spa spears yeah. instead yeah. of just club heads. Yes. And so, of course, the way it changes, they're very, very slow. Yeah. Around the year 5000 BC, mm. not yesterday, yeah. uh, a kind of a change took place. Exactly. Nobody quite knows how. Mm. And instead of a traditional society in which there really is no top and bottom, everybody who gets over a certain age probably 35, mm -hmm. goes in the Council of Elders. Mm -hmm. By 35, in those days, you are eld. Yes. <laughs> and they discuss what's to be done. Mm -hmm. And the, the government is, again, traditional and kinship. Anyway, around 5000 BC, in a few parts of the world, in uh, part of the, the work of the, 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 the Nile, you've mm -hmm. heard of the Nile? Yes, yeah, sure. That's where the pharaohs reared a new kind of world in which there was a command, and That's they right. were the command on top. Yeah. And the, the Tigris and Euphrates Valley, yeah. and in India, in the Ganges River, a place called Mohenjo-daro, mm -hmm. and in China, in the Yangtze, a few places. In North America, our country, no place. Not in North America, but in Mesoamerica, we, we did we, have. We, I, uh, we, had it in, uh, we had it in what we call well, uh, uh, in Incaville, where the Incas yeah. were, yeah. up on top of the That's where I did my doctoral, Alps, di my, so I did so. my doctoral dissertation on did the really? prehistory of the Bolivian Altiplano. It was very ah. fascinating. It was based on the potato, you know, it was agriculture. They right. had a unique food complex, but it was interesting. That was one of the places where they went through from Paleolithic to Neolithic. Like that? Yeah, well, well but anyway, that's what happened. It happened, it happened. And, then, yeah. and, then, and at, that, at that age of time, between 5000 BC and 3000 BC, over those 2,000 years, yeah. little by little, a new kind of way of making society work, which is what economics is about, mm -hmm. emerged what, that, what we call command societies. Yeah. Whether it was a king on top or an emperor or a lord or, or, or whoever the hell it was, yeah. uh, there, was a, there was a great, like, like, like the, uh, the Egyptian pharaohs. Mm -hmm. And the Egyptian pharaoh said, we're going to build the pyramid there, and we're going to, mm -hmm. Yes. You didn't have that in hunting and gathering. There wasn't any pricing <laughs> structure or anything <laughs> no. like that. It there was wasn't just much, done by command. wasn't much money. Yeah. Uh, tr trading was done in a much more traditional way. Yes. Uh, but the society worked, and those societies created what you would call empires. Yes, indeed. So politically, M militarily, they, oh, an enormous change. Mm -hmm. Economically, a big change, but nothing like what we would call economics. Nothing like what we would call economics, which is mm. so prevalent now and important mm. now, and mm. it doesn't really begin in terms of you bring the chapter until mm. we get to about the time of Adam Smith. That's Smith. right. Yeah. I mean, in, in most of Pharaonic Egypt, there's no money. Uh -huh. I mean, the pharaoh has gold. Yes. People don't have money. Right. What is money? Right. And, uh, th th there are no stores. Right. You know, I mean, you make it one of a person who specializes in in making, I don't know, cloth, yes, yes, right. and he, he, you trade his cloth for, you don't bargain about the yeah, price, the cloth is, is 11 onions. Yes, okay, right. You give yeah. him 11 onions, you take it. It still goes on, cloth. like in New Guinea and other kinds of places. It does. Yeah, yeah. But in any event, this, th this thing that developed the market, it came to be where the market was important, and it does begin, and it's quite true when we say the beginning of modern, what we call economics, could begin and be nicely marked with Mr. 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 Smith, Adam Smith, right? Yeah, around Adam, it's an interesting to remember date, 1776. Right? Yeah, you yeah. got it exactly. Yeah. You wrote, you read that page very well, and I was amazed when I learned it. That said, that when Adam Smith, this very ab absent-minded, odd 
guy who yeah. was a, actually a remarkable philosopher Prodigious and scholar. a kind of sociologist yeah. and a kind of political scientist. Anyway, when he wrote the book that we call The Wealth of Nations, yeah. uh, he, what shall I say, he didn't have in mind quite what we call an economy. Mm -hmm. He didn't have, you know, the word capitalism had never been invented. He had in mind a, a society of perfect liberty. Uh -huh. He had in mind, how does a society mm -hmm. in which people are no longer slaves, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be a perfect mm -hmm. liberty, and they aren't uh, serfs, yeah. you can't kick them in the face and throw them off the farm. Yeah. They're perfectly free mm -hmm. to work or not work and make money or not make money. It's a free society. How does such a society hang together? And if you had been in that time, mm -hmm. you would have been amazed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's a question, right? Yeah, he was and a moral philosopher. That's, that's right. right. And you, you would read, read the book and you would have said, son of a gun, mm -hmm. this guy really knows something I didn't know before. A lot of people anyway, did. Anyway, yeah. 1776, yes. that's when that book came out. Yeah. There was a little event taking place in Boston, if you remember. Yes, there was indeed. And uh, so uh, that w that's what we call, uh, when. W that's when what we call economics begins. Yeah, and there, there were some developments in technology that were beginning to have steam engine and some of those things we about that. The beginning of what we call the Industrial Revolution might be dated around industrial the same industrial time. Industrial, yeah. 1776, yeah. Industrial Revolution, 100 years later. Mm. So it's all very modern. It's yeah. all very new as, right. as history is. So this thing we call economics, which is so prevalent in terms of the uh, concern of the contemporary situation, the human situation, uh, is is relatively recent in terms of that, and it Absolutely. should be to understood. And we've had, I don't know how many people you highlight in total, a dozen or so in your book, where you highlight the great thinkers, the oh, large thinkers. A dozen so will forth. do. A dozen a, will uh, do. It's around Maybe a dozen, two dozen. I mean, who, who have sort of in a certain sense out of, uh, I don't know if they hold cloth, but beginning with Adam Smith, right. you had these people and you had some critiques and so forth, and that's what your book is concerned about. And kind it's of. very, very prevalent. The book, uh, book is thinking. about, I mean, very briefly, in the yes. chapter I talk about, hunting and gathering, just to to tell people, just like I had to learn it myself, yeah. son of a gun, that's how we live the 99% of our time that's on right. Earth. Yeah. And then, very briefly, how sort of commands arose yeah. in, in a few places of the world. We're not really exactly quite sure mm -hmm. how some people got thrust up as lords mm -hmm. and other people got thrust down as uh, serfs and slaves, yeah. not sure. Yeah. But there it was, and that took care of the next, I'm making this up, 3%, 4% of human history. Yeah. And all of a sudden, We've reached the year, it isn't 1776, yeah, we've we'll reached the year 1600. Yeah. Not so long ago. No, it's just the last, I believe. American colonies are, are being That's opened right. up. Yeah. And for the first time, things like trade are legitimate. You mm -hmm. can do it. Mm -hmm. You can bargain this without, with, without going with to great risk of uh, the Lord throwing you off his plate and mm -hmm. much, much worse. Yeah. S some of the elements that make up the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Some of the elements that make up the idea that you, a perfectly plain, ordinary professor, mm -hmm. nothing special, no, mm -hmm. no links with the, the man who owns with the, the Lord, yeah, no, the that, Lord of that the manor. You have a right to make money. Yeah. You think you would have had a right to make money 200 years earlier? Come yeah. on, uh, only come the, here. Only, yeah, the, yeah, that idea was only, yeah. the, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the uh, acquisitive kind That's of right. uh, assumption of it, the it, human. It, 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 it was, if you were, if you were, a great man, a noble man, yeah. you were entitled to riches. How did Julius Caesar get to be rich when he was, I don't know when he was right. finally chosen to be the next emperor? He was given the sort of governorship mm -hmm. of Spain. This is back in what, 200 BC. I don't yeah. know. Spain was the, where the mines were, that gold was mined. He was the supervisor of the entire enterprise mm -hmm. as well as the whole place called Spain. Mm -hmm. And he went up without much money and he came down rich as hell. Now, how do you suppose that happened? Well, that was a conquest. That, right. Yeah, right. That was the kind of thing. But this story of the, from the modern time, it, it picks up on that, and it begins with Adam Smith, and then it goes through, and we say it doesn't. You've got some major thinker. You have a, a critique of the, it came to be called capitalism. When did the term capitalism come to be characteristic of, uh, you know, as we talk, the market, or interchange with the notion of the market? And we want to talk, before we're through here now, about the disappearance of many economic uh, textbooks of the word capitalism in any event. Now doesn't, it EU. doesn't appear in Adam Smith. It, it does not appear. No. Nope. No. No. And the word capital appears. Was it a, a term of approbation, do you think? I, I don't know, to yeah, tell right. the truth. The mm -hmm. term capital appears. That th there's a difference between wealth and capital. Wealth yeah. is what you get when you're a great lord mm -hmm. and you get gold, mm -hmm. whether you whether you whether I steal it or get it wrested from the yeah. ground myself. Mercantilism. I, get gold. I got wealth now. Yeah. Right? Uh, when you're a professor and I'm a professor, and we set up a business in a world that now allows businesses, the next thing you know, we have money, we have something more than gold. We mm -hmm. have wealth. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I don't want to say we can. I can sell it. I can. I can't. If if, if I have gold at home, mm -hmm. I'm not going to trade that gold in for cloth, for no. God's sakes. No. Uh, that's wealth. Yeah. You don't get rid of wealth by getting rid of it. You just put it inside the pyramid. Yeah. Right. Uh, when you and I have set up our little business mm -hmm. and made a little money yeah. and some of it in gold coin, yeah. it's money. Yeah. And uh, I say to you. Gosh, what do you what do you do when I want your money on the, on the weekends? Yeah. You say my wife spends it. Yes, yeah, that's right. Well, yeah. I, I never heard the word like she what? Yeah. And anyway, so you've entered a new world in which yeah. something like money is invented. Yes. Uh -huh. And to make a long story, that spreads. It becomes the normal way of carrying things on. Yeah. This would not have been true in Christopher Columbus's time. Yeah. There was no such normal way. You carried on by the book. It was more mercantile in that sort it of thing. And it was the a, whoever could get the bullion was the one who measured wealth, that sort of thing. Well, but, speaking, but also, in the, in the modern experience, wealth it can be seen by some, anyway, between income and wealth. Wealth are the yeah. things that are going to be capital goods that are going to create, yes, that's create right. an, a, a forward advance in terms of the, that's right. of the, of the capability of the society. But there was no name for it. I mean, yeah. hey, what, what, is, what is Adam wealth Smith? Wealth of nations. What does yeah. Adam, yes. <laughs> yes. Adam Smith call this new world in which people are free to make money? Yeah. You can go to work for a certain sum or, or say, no, I won't. You couldn't do that as a serf. You couldn't say, no, That's sir. That's right. Yeah, Thank yeah, you yeah, yeah. And uh, he calls it a society of perfect liberty. Okay, right. And you can do what you want. And it's again to remember he's coming off a position of moral, uh, right. you know, uh, right. moral, moral sentiments. philosophy. Right. And that, but now he was the beginning of it and so forth. And then we've had these other people that have gone through. One great uh, person who took exception to the, uh, in general, the market economy or the capitalist economy was Karl Marx yep. right? and the whole socialist critique. Yep. If that's, that's fair right. to link uh, Karl Marx with the socialists, there were other socialists Karl as well. Marx is that's a major development in terms of economics, did you think, on the Marx world made scale? Ma Marx made an enormous impression yeah. in the middle 1800s yeah. in his books at some uh, in two ways. Mm -hmm. he, did, he was really a very brilliant man. Yes, indeed. And he explained better than had yet been explained what was meant by value. Yes. Uh, the funny, elusive word. And he has, his explanation is by no means the only one in the world, but it was very powerful. Mm -hmm. And he also, uh, and uh, he, three things. He explained value. That's a technical thing. He stood for socialism. There had already been socialists. That is to say, people should be more equal. They shouldn't be rich and poor. Mm -hmm. If you're poor, you should be given some sort of subsistence aid and help. Mm -hmm. The equality is mm -hmm. socialism. Mm -hmm. And he was a Marx was a, f a deep socialist. Absolutely, yeah. And and and, f and and conveyed this world in brilliant terms. And the last thing he did on the negative side was very naive about politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he deeply believed in socialism. Deeply believe that capitalism was very bad for very many reasons, and a tremendous deep-seated distrust of the institution of private property and Absolutely. private ownership. Everything yeah. in capitalism out. Yeah. But when the socialists took over one day, it would be perfect. So yeah. the naivete. Yeah. Of Marx did many wonderful things, yeah. in intellectually speaking. Yeah. One very bad thing he did politically, he he instilled this political naivete. Look at the Russians for the gods. I mean, yeah. the, the, the expectations of, of Stalin. Mm -hmm. He would be a wonderful man, wouldn't he? Mm. Uh, we should yeah. look. Yeah, we should look well, for him. Well, right? one of the things you point out at the including chapter, we got to get to that because that's the thing you've just added to the seventh edition. So you point out that there's the acquisitive nature of mankind, and then there's this idea of the marketplace, and then there's also the idea of there being two factors or two okay. sectors. Two as sectors. It were. You've got a private sector, right. and then you have a governmental sector. Right. And if you do away with private property or the institution of private property in individual hands, then you've got a one-factor society where all power is in the hand of the state. That right. can be dangerous. Right. And it's, it can be dangerous and of all powers and, and Marx in one hand. Marx never thought about that. Uh -huh. I mean, that, that's it. We've learned a lot yeah. about, about all state economies, uh -huh. like the Soviet Union. Yeah. They're no good. Uh, we've learned something about all private economies, no government. I don't think I'd like to live in such a place. Mm -hmm. You need, we need, we, we've learned, I think, and I think Adam Smith told us already, you need an economy in which you have government to do certain kinds of things which society needs but which don't pay money, mm -hmm. aren't profitable, like mm -hmm. building roads. Uh -huh. They're not profitable. Yeah. Or providing medical care yeah. and things like that. There's a real need for a governmental sector mm -hmm. and there's a real need for a private sector. He was very cl clear about the fact that a society of, quote, perfect liberty had mm -hmm. to have both. Yeah. If, if you go again uh, with that Adam Smith basis and then Marx's uh, critique of that, and you're going to distribute the, um, 
you know, distribute wealth inside the terms of the society. Within a social security, if you don't have the market to where you can uh, you know, bargain, bargain for your labor input to a production or something like that, if you don't have a way that you can do that, um, then it comes down to where you're going to distribute according to some general notion of what the need is among the people and <laughs> distribute it out. And is the, is the profit motive or the idea of the profit motive and advancement able to be contained with, uh, conti continued and the advantages of that done within a socialist critique or do you tend to but, uh, lose that, do you think? Socialism never really considered those problems seriously. It well, just they are important questions, are they not? Nowadays, yeah. nowadays people who still would like to have a more socialist ick. More uh, equitable, perhaps? Yes. Fair to say, yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly think they're going to be markets. They don't want distribution just by tradition in the old days. They don't want distribution just by some guy saying, you get this much and you get that much. That, that they want markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that, that distribution of income in a, in a pure sense would be done by some notion of that they get that because they need it. Well, you need housing, you need to, and it's based upon distribution according to need. Was I what think that's Mar right. Mar I, mean, I think say. socialistic people today, today believe, I believe, yeah. uh, you can have a mix. Okay. Uh, let the market work. Okay. Uh, if, the, if you don't like the fact that the market makes some people too rich, it's just a moral, I mean, there's no thing that's absolutely too rich, yeah. just too rich to make you feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you have a tax law, mm -hmm. and when you make over a million dollars a year, you pay a certain amount to the mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. And when the market makes some people too poor, mm -hmm. uh, you remedy that. Mm -hmm. uh, they get free schooling, they get, they get uh, social assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that happens today in yeah. most of the world. Uh -huh. It can be done well, it can be done poorly. But mm -hmm. We don't do it very well in this country. In a market economy, the people, let's say the mass of the people, other than those who own the wealth or own capital assets or something, which has usually been over the longer haul relatively few relative to the great population. Oh, yes. Most of the people have been able to gain income for buying food and clothes and sure. housing from their labor input and they're being able to bargain their labor That's or right. to get a better uh, return on their labor. Does, that's an important principle, and we have in the United States, if I may, this idea of Marx used to call it the surplus value of labor, or in general the idea, the, the labor theory of value. Look, Would, could you address yourself to well, that, and is there something well, else that's needed beyond well, that, or Marx, uh, are systems based essentially on that, because most income is distributed according to labor or job criteria, are they not? From the very beginning, mm -hmm. one of the things that people try to explain whether there was some way of of explaining mm -hmm. how what incomes derive from yeah. now the income called wages that derived from work yes right income come rent how did that derive from mm. that's, not, that's very different right. rent is not the same thing as selling no. the crops no. it's what what's left over that's right. like, when you yeah. put you own the land yeah. income come profit mm -hmm. uh, Marx felt that the the real injustice of the system he called capitalism yes was the fact that the employer was in a strategic position bargaining against the labor. You're the laborer, I'm yeah, the employer. Right, right. Uh, I, you come to me and say, yeah, I'd, I'd like a job. I say, well, I got a job for you. And you say, and what does it pay, sir? And five cents an hour on I the said, hour. I yeah. said five cents an hour. And, and you say, think to yourself, oh, that's awfully little. But yeah. you think to yourself twice, if I don't say yes, I'm going to get nothing. That's right. And you've got bread to get for the kids. That's right. right yeah. So the, yeah. the, the, in a sense, I'm a terrible simplification, yes. but in a sense, Marx didn't like it because the, ca the capitalist had a better bargaining position. Yeah. He was in a stronger position to say, take it or leave it, right. than the worker. Once in a while, workers could turn the tables around and say, mm -hmm. well, sir, if you don't want me, want me in your place, then, you know. I'll go uh, down I'll the I'll street go, yeah, if right. it gets that way, but yeah. Th that was the big baby. Yeah. And, uh, Somehow, the, 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 I think we've learned the very hard way through history that you can have a society that works pretty well with markets that pay wages, with markets in which entrepreneur, businessmen keep profits, and in which some landlords keep rents. Mm -hmm. Rents isn't all that damn important. Mm, yeah. But I've also learned that all these kinds, all those kinds of economies, all of which are called capitalisms, yeah. which, by the way, was first Mr. Marx who called the word, and then it, it, got, it got publicized, used in the English language as late as the 19th century, uh, a, a historian called Trevelyan uh -huh. used the word. Right. It was enormously popular. Everybody used it until very recently. We'll yeah. talk about that. Now it's interesting. It's being phased out. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's yeah. a funny bit. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we, we've learned something that uh, I find very puzzling and very, very important. Yes that mon modern-day societies are hung together and they work. 
not by tradition, it plays a small role, uh, not by kinship. Yes, at Thanksgiving table, yeah. uh, whether mother or father eats first, or father eats first, or who gets first service, and so on. Yes, there's a little bit of kinship, and, uh, and who gets the job, your brother-in-law and your yeah. second cousin, you know, a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and tradition yeah. is some. Yeah. And it certainly is, there's some power, a few places, I mean, th there can be gentle power as well as, I mean, I mean the government is power. Yeah. And the man in charge of the police force says, yes, you, you take that test and so on. No, you can't. That's power of a kind. So there's some power and there's certainly some tradition, but most of it is done by bargaining. Mm -hmm. You and I, mm -hmm. Dicker, mm -hmm. uh, or put it differently, I go to the store. Uh, I, don't, I don't like those prices. I don't buy there. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy who runs the store says to himself, People aren't buying what they used to. Maybe I can cut my price. And he goes back to his suppliers. He bargains and mm -hmm. dickers. And, and in a free way, uh, prices are set by what economists call demand. Mm -hmm. That's what you and I are willing to spend. Mm -hmm. And supply. Mm -hmm. That's what you and I would be willing to have to charge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yes, it, it works. It can work pretty well. Sometimes monopolies turn up. There are always things that can go bad. But by and large, a capitalist society mm -hmm. in which there are the government sector, private sector, mm -hmm. and the public sector. Mm -hmm. There's bargaining, called a network of markets, and there are people making money mm -hmm. as a driver. Mm -hmm. Seems to work pretty well. But here's the thing: what what I find very puzzling is that you have countries, many countries, that have these basic institutions, but they're different. French capitalism is not like German capitalism. American capitalism is not like even Canadian capitalism. Or Scandinavian. Or, or Scandinavian, yes, yeah. or English. Mm -hmm. There's something in a country's tradition yes. which is very hard to put your finger Some on. Some of those larger intuitive kind of senses. I don't know what yeah. it is. Yeah. But all I know is that there's more, that, that although capitalism is a, has to be understood mm -hmm. for what it is. It is markets. Mm -hmm. It is people being free to make money, acquisitiveness. It is the two sectors, public and private. That's what capitalism is. Yes. With those institutions, you've, you've blocked out a kind of economic machinery, mm -hmm. but the same machine can produce different societies. The, the difference is a subtle, but you right. know it's different when you cross the line yeah. into Canada, which yeah. is so much that, like that. That's right, yeah. When you're abroad and you're in Germany and you cross the line, you're yeah. in, in, in France, it's, it isn't just the language that changes, it's the way of life. Yes, sir. Not all together. Yeah. That don't mean that there's slavery in France. and yeah, well, right. But things are done differently, yeah. and, and reverse it's very important. Yeah, one of the things you've taken some exception to in this, mod in the, in the, this the seventh edition, which is coming out in 1999, is uh, some exception to the very narrow kind of scientific reading of quantitative analysis of only economics, which takes out of account the more comprehensive sociology, anthropological, and larger intuitive kind of sensing that you thought was more characteristic of the traditional economist. There's a couple of them that we might be able to talk about. One is one that you had great admiration for, and one is you sat in on the lecture. A couple of the people modern is Lord Keynes, and then you've got uh, Mr. Shumpeter, which seems to be the darling of many people. Now, maybe you could just address yourself to the contribution of those two gentlemen, uh, and then we do have to get to Chapter 7, or the last <laughs> chapter of the book now, no, or, or the I'm seventh edition of the... I'm going to be quick with Mr. Keynes. Yes, sir. Uh, up to the time, up to time uh, his name was John, Yeah. Maynard, K-E-Y-N-E-S, mm -hmm. Mark Keynes. Uh, he hated the f first name. He called him John. He didn't get invited back for lunch. Really? No, Keynes. No. His name was Maynard. Yeah. That was his friendly name. Mm -hmm. And Maynard Keynes was an extraordinarily brilliant. Yes. His father was brilliant. And he had what well, I can only can say, describe a, a new vision. The vision of the economy, the picture we've been talking about, has been a vision, an attempt to explain, picture the thing. Mm -hmm. The picture of the economy as a whole people making money and trading on, on markets and two sectors was a picture in which uh, it was many, many supply and many, many little m markets like this, which sub suppliers and demanders interacted. Yeah. Prices changed all the time. Mm -hmm. Just like you don't go down the road in the summer and you find the price of, of corn isn't the same today as it was yesterday. That's right. Prices kept changing and there were mechanisms at work, that's too hard to explain, mm -hmm. which markets interact and on the whole, mm -hmm. by and large, with exceptions, mm -hmm. market economies adjusted themselves. Mm -hmm. And most of the sort of picture of economics that was written about from the time of Adam Smith, really, mm -hmm. down to the Great Depression, mm -hmm. was the picture of how 
a society hung together when its, when its structure was essentially markets. Mm -hmm. this, th this doesn't picture it too well, but you get the idea, sort of. Buyers and sellers interacting. The Great World Depression in the 1930s had a tremendous influence oh. on the uh, sanguinity of people thinking about the market yeah, economy in traditional terms. All oh. the, yeah. I'm not exaggerating, yeah. just a small amount. Yeah. All the economics that was written from Adam Smith up to 1930-something or other mm -hmm. uh, was the economics of how, believe it or not, an economy in which people did what they wanted to do mm -hmm. could hang together. Yeah. Because if I told you that and we hadn't gone through this long yes, talk, right. you would have thought, come on. <laughs> but, but yes, yeah. you can show, mm -hmm. starting from you and I and then broadening out, yes, it can hang together. That doesn't mean it will. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you can't have crazy ideas yeah. and make the market go wrong. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that people can't get manias and, and start send the market out of all, all reach. But it used mm -hmm. to be begin to understand. And then came the Great Depression. Yeah, just threw everything into a cocktail. And, and the market yeah. system to us wasn't working mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And it wasn't working because prices were, were not adjusting. It yeah. was working because the bottom was falling out of the thing. Right. The idea that the bottom could fall out was, was not an idea mm -hmm. that was talked about. And, I mean, Prior it never that. entered the, yeah. the Adam Smith's idea. And Mr. Keynes addressed this thing? Yes, addressed he did. This because situation? Uh, As I suppose all economists did at that time. Everybody well, there was a, 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 lot, it, a, lot, of con con a lot of much back and forth. Yeah, right. Much. And the idea basically was uh, markets wiggled, mm. uh, but there was something else going on, a kind of river, mm -hmm. a river called spending, expenditure, your and my collective consumption spending, yeah. all that we spend for clothes and things we eat and wear and so on. Demand. And the other, ro uh, the ro uh, the other river of spending, what firms spent for machinery, for, for buildings, for capital goods. And the idea was, well, those rivers would roll on and Suddenly, in the 1930s, yeah. one of the rivers stopped. Uh -huh. It was the river for spending for new machinery. Yeah. I'm exaggerating terribly, but, yes, not, I but the yeah. idea comes across. Yeah. And in 1930, why? Well, the market really did take a terrible mm -hmm. fall. A whole bunch of cycles came together or whatever. Yes, yeah. uh, l lots of reasons which yeah. would take me too long to yes. explain. Yes, yes, and we're still but pondering why. Yeah. I mean, in the same way that we don't understand it terribly yeah. well, when, it, when we have a mild collapse tomorrow, and, mm -hmm. and we always Newspaper headline, market falls yeah. by 3%. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it, when the market really fell, and with the market, spending dried up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with spending, in other words, uh, you and I as, as corporate executives, I say to you because we're buddies, how much you spend for, for new plant and equipment next year, mm -hmm. bud? And you say, you, you, you out of your mind? Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Yes, how much right. are you? And I said, well, tell the truth, same thing, they're not spending a damn yeah, thing. Right, right, right. So we weren't spending any money. Yeah. And the result was unemployment on a mass scale. Yeah, 25, There have always been yeah. some unemployment. Yeah. But yeah. my God, my yeah. God, the yeah. bottom fell out of it. Yeah, it was a and horror. Nobody knew what to do. And a man, in a manner of speaking, again to exaggerate, John Maynard came, 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 came up with the answer. The answer was it was possible not only for consumers to spend, mm -hmm. and they could be helped in their spending if the government would help a little bit more generous, and not only was there, of course, businesses spending, and that could be helped a little if better um, taxes or something, but there was another spender, there was another river, and the river was the government river. The government itself could spend mm -hmm. more, whether it's spent for, for more artillery, yeah. or whether it's spent yeah, for cleaning the beaches, like or, a war, which or is over the drilling yeah. for yeah. the government was was an yeah. it, the government was a potential spender, uh, yeah. just like you and, the, yeah. and me. Yeah, you could do it with. It, they could even do it within a context of deficit, where the, the pump priming, as Absolutely. the term came to be, could get the economy Absolutely. going, and it did in the second war. Right. Yeah. That yeah. the government could be a major element in keeping the economy going. This put came as heresy, yeah. crazy. And then, and, and Lord Shock. Keynes also set up the context of what followed the Second War with the International Monetary Fund, the International well, World Bank, no, some and of that. that yes, Brenton he did. Woods thing. No, no, he set up just before true. he died. And it was interesting. Chum Peter and Keynes were born in the same year, no? Yeah. Eighty-three yeah. was yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. But Keynes made the extraordinary, made made the made the the revolutionary statement, which is still. Not entirely accepted. I think accepted by 99% of economists, but there's a 1% of economists that doesn't, and accepted by 85% of Congress people, but wildly rejected by 15%. Namely, it's all right for the government to spend. Mm -hmm. Namely, mm -hmm. the government should spend more when times are bad. Yes. And the and to stimulate. Yeah. Just got to do it. Yeah. Right. Thirdly. If the government doesn't have the money in the till, of course, it can actually print its own money. But yeah, if the government, yeah, it can go and borrow money yeah, yeah. and sell bonds 
And if somebody offered you a government bond to pay 8%, would you say, no, thank you? Yeah, right. No, you'd yeah, say, yeah. thank you very much. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So the uh, Keynes may change the vision. Changed yeah. the game. Yeah, he was really large, and he's still there. And at one time, even Mr. Nixon, before he right. did say we're all Keynesians now right. at one point. Right. But things have changed. Things go in cycle. And it might be that Mr. Maybe we could just touch briefly on Mr. Schumpeter, who seems to be now in the minds of many people who are calling shots that are very important in terms of the world economy, seems to be somebody that many people are preparing to to get a sense of what's going on now. And he was a major figure as well, and oh, I think it was the last chapter in the last book, right, that you dealt with Mr. He was Humpeter. the last chapter. He was such a wonderful, crazy, mar marvelous guy yeah. with so many bright ideas. Yeah. He, he was smarter than Keynes. He was, he was more original than Adam Smith. He really was an amazing man. Yeah. It's very hard to say in any particular thing what he did. What he did was he wrote a book you should read. Yes, <laughs> well, I, I just did, twice, it's, 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 <laughs> this it's, last couple of weeks. It's always very yeah. clever. He makes you see the economy, and yeah. co partly as Keynesian economy, partly as a Smithian economy, partly as a Schumpeterian. It's complicated. Yeah, right. But, but he sort of refreshed economic thinking. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, we are going through a very funny period in which, in a manner of speaking, most economists see what Keynes is writing about. Lots of problems in the government being a, being a spender. Lots of problems in business being a spender, too. You know, mm -hmm. Lots of problems in markets, right? Yeah. I mean, nobody ever said the markets aren't without their monopolies and their good market laws and bad laws. Yeah. Economics, once you get out of, I mean, tradition, yeah. and once you get out of command, command mm -hmm. has its own problems, but they're political, yes, right? Sir. Yes, you sir. Say yeah. You say go there, but you should have said go there. Right, right, right. Once the economy gets going, the way we've been talking about it, it works. Mm -hmm well enough. It, we had early depressions in the 1850s. We had yeah. no, we're not so, not so mild. A yeah, whole series of yeah. them. But it didn't come apart. Yeah. Capitalism worked. Uh, it encouraged technology. As mm -hmm. a result, it grew. Mm -hmm. and, and in the sense that you're in my income. I don't mean in the dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean the things we have, the automobiles, the TV sets, the mm -hmm. The, the the medical technology yeah. that's real riches and he he had a he had if I may I uh, one problem we don't have, we could talk for sixteen hours easy but he had a sort of in a certain sense it seems to me an arist almost quasi aristocratic oh, yeah. disdain for the bourgeoisie Very high. in a certain sense and he had a great respect for the entrepreneur I think yep. and he talked about the creative entrepreneur uh, or as spirit and as we think in terms of an age now where in industrial economy that we're coming into this information based right. cybernetic right, right, based right, right, right. global economy now the role of the entrepreneur Mr. Gates just came out of a garage somewhere in Boston or something right. like that and they create these whole worlds of these two kids started a thing Yahoo it's 35 billion dollars in a couple of years it's amazing you know that there's this entrepreneurial thing he had a great thing for the creative destruction as it were of entrepreneurial systems Absolutely. and so he seems to have a great favorite uh, status among a great number of people who are trying to understand what in the world's going on. He's not read by businessmen. Mm -hmm. He's too. He's too. He's too complicated. I don't oh. mean. I don't mean difficult. Oh. He's, he's too. He's too. He's too much of a. He's, like he's an oddball. Yeah, he is. Yeah. <laughs> he's a wonderful oddball. I yeah. love him, but I don't think he's read by businessmen. Businessmen don't read. Businessmen d don't read any books at all. You don't think so, right? Not they don't, know, they don't have no, that. No, but I is think he, not. All right, but then I wonder if we could. Then he's there, and there are a lot of people repair to him, Mr. Cudlow. I know and other people do. People do do that. They say and they're looking for a vision, and you talk about the vision thing. Mr. Bush, our president, said the vision thing. He, in a certain sense, derided it. But you talk about it, and he talked about the vision thing, and he said ultimately it is the vision that we're going to be interested in. And what about the role of the vision, or a larger comprehensive understanding of what's going on? Economics is so important now as we globalize. We uh, are, uh, our international institutions is, are, is. are not there. We're globalizing. We don't have international institutions comparable to those at a nation state level. Right. We have these tremendous problems. And do you think, and particularly to maybe bring us around, we only got a few minutes, I'm afraid, that final chapter that you added to the seventh edition, which is coming out in 1999, addresses that thing and if I, addresses that issue. And if I may, it seems to me you're saying that some of the economists now are taking too narrow a view yep. of what the economics are, and we shouldn't do that because it's too important to be obfuscated by having a narrow view and that we may be heading for trouble. We should have a, a wider vision, or maybe you could just address yourself okay. to that. Okay, I'll tell all of you in 27 seconds. Okay, yeah, okay. okay. That's, a, that's a haiku I, I, sound bite. I, th I huh? think there are two visions mm -hmm. that are needed by not just, of course, they need by economists. They need by business people. They need by people going to college. The or whole world community. They're needed by thoughtful people yeah. who live in a capitalist society. Yeah. One is 
there is a very important role for government. Mm -hmm. You may define it differently from I and so on, but you can't say it's government out. There are people in Congress who essentially say you don't need government. Yeah, laissez-faire. Right? A lot of people like that. Yeah. Government can play a vital role. Yeah. And that would be one. I, I can't define it. I mean, it may, may be a little different from J for Japan mm -hmm. than it is for us. Maybe a little mm -hmm. different for Georgia than it is for North Carolina. All right. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. I know it's a vital role for government to play, and that's one of the things that must be worked through mm -hmm. in, so that you're at peace with it. And yes, mm -hmm. the government's going to spend money. Yes, they're going to borrow money. Yes, mm -hmm. they're going to do medical research. Mm -hmm. No, they're not going to, and so on. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Yeah. That's, that's for business people to do, yeah. and it's for people, like maybe like myself, to try to put a persuasive argument, mm -hmm. which can help people make up their mind. The yeah. other thing that needs to be done is for economists. Economists have fallen in love with the idea that essentially economics is science. Yes. Well, you know, science is the single most prestigious activity carried on in our time. What's I mean, the most? Up on the moon and, yeah. and my God almighty, H-bombs, forgive me, and, and, and what it does with health. Science is extraordinary. What's the most? You said it's the second most. Prominent oh, science, no, science. no, 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 I said there are two, two, uh, two things. One is people got to come to grips with and to a peace with yeah. some coherent idea that government is necessary. I and see, good. Yeah. That's uh -huh. number one. Yeah. Number two, economists. Yeah. They got to come to grips with the idea that science, no, not science, that economics yeah. is not just another branch of science I see. like genetics yes. or like this yeah. or like that. Yeah. That indeed you can do very important scientific uh, research mm -hmm. on on economies. You can discover how much money it takes to do dot dot dot. Right. You can run long uh, correlations yes, right. between what you do here and what happens there. But when you're all done, what you do in the economy is not dictated by what science has told you to do in genetics. It's too narrow. It's too narrow. Uh -huh. It's what you know plus feelings plus moral values mm -hmm. plus the feel that you have to get by living and learning and thinking back. And this was characteristic of the great worldly philosophers who were tending to lose it now? Uh, I mean, yes. I think? Yes. In the economics profession. Yes, say, I think so. Yeah. I think the economic philosophers were not only, let's put quotes on it, were scientific. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, a little Truth mathematical. Truth tellers, yeah, yeah. All right, looking, yeah. looking for something like science yes. in a way. Mm -hmm. They were also very much aware that they, that what they did was uh, very responsible mm -hmm. for moral things. Adam Morality, Smith, yeah. Adam Smith. He was a moral philosopher. Who did, who yeah. Adam Smith discovers yeah. the idea for the first time yeah. that by taking a, 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 a job, he, does, he talks about making pins. Mm -hmm. Yes, Instead indeed. of each yeah. guy, Specialization, yeah. first, yeah. first he cuts the yeah. thing and then yeah. he puts the shot. Each guy makes a whole pin. Yeah. E there are ten operations in a pen. It takes a hell of a long time. Yeah. At the end of the but day, you get a heck of a pins. production uh, productivity. Adam yeah. Smith yeah. said, "No, no, you get ten guys in yeah. the factory. Yeah. One guy just cuts, one guy does yeah. this, yeah. and you don't make the, the ten guys don't make a hundred pins. They make ten thousand pins." Yeah, Mr. Ford took that lesson. That, yeah. That's right. Yeah. The division of labor. Now he also said that you do indeed increase productivity. Mm -hmm. That isn't his word, but you yeah. do indeed yeah. increase wealth very greatly. Mm -hmm. But a man who whole life is confined to one or a few simple operations will become, these are his words, as stupid and ignorant as it is possible mm -hmm. for a human being to become. Yeah. So there is a philosopher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 the economics is wonderful of the division of labor, but mm -hmm. you pay a moral price. Mm -hmm. So his, his vision was in, engulfed the, the psychological consequences yeah. of something you did to turn on more pins. It's a very good thing to turn yeah, on more pins. Yeah, you make yeah, pins cheaper yeah, and it's good yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah. Very bad for the guy who makes it. Modern day economics looks at results, looks at inputs. Net outputs. present value. That's right. all they look at a computer screen. Whatever well, can be value. put in, yeah. given a number, yeah. you do that. Or you can maybe not do that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. they, mo modern economics doesn't look for the political mm -hmm. and the psychological the and the sociological yeah. and all the other logical. Or the comprehensive kind mm -hmm. of overview of it, which is, the pro the, which is part of what we call vision. And as we were saying off camera before we started, is that reality does not have these divisions. Reality is a seamless web. I mean, mm -hmm. the Hindus have told us that, and it is. Yep. And there's a larger context within which all of these things should be taken into account, political and so forth as well, and a vision thing. Do you, do you, do you, I don't want to say, are you, are you, 
I do. I lack for, among our political, our leadership, a sense of compelling vision I among do our leadership, I both do political, too. business, or I do intellectual. I do and too. do we and not one want one to find that? One of the reasons is that, eco not economics exactly, yes. but the spirit of economics has captured our imagination. Mm -hmm. If you can counter it, that's all right. If yeah. you make a model of it, that's fine. If you can draw a graph of it, yeah. that's what you want. And, and, you, you, and we don't live in a world in which you tend to think mm -hmm. to naturally in moral, behavioral terms, mm -hmm. the way Lincoln and Jefferson yeah. and those wonderful people who were our early philosopher kings, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kings yes did think. They mm -hmm. thought in moral terms, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. just in numerical terms. So there's a much broader canvas that we should be drawing yes. our yes. inspiration and leadership from. Yes. Mr. Schumpeter had a sense of By all means, read the great economists because yes. they have both. Yes. When you read regular economists, remember that the numerical thing is very important. I don't yeah. for a yeah. second yeah, put right. it down. Understand. Right. Has to be has, has to be backed up by right. your own values. Yeah, there's a thing, and cybernetics are coming so quickly now with the internet and the computers. It's amazing what's going on now, and the, the sort of thing. Uh, and there's a thing that comes out of cybernetics where you feel you have information overload. Some people think, but it allows for pattern recognition of uh, systems, uh, a systems of a systems kind of thinking. We might be able to get a broad kind of overreading of what's going on, and that's what I think. Perhaps you, I know certainly that's what I am in quest of, as it were. And I think you are as me well. Too. No? Yeah. Me too. And right now, that's I'm, what really I'm, matters. Right now, I'm unhappy. I say so in that last chapter because yes. I find too much emphasis on quote science yeah. and not enough on morality. Yeah, morality, or on a larger, comprehensive right. reading of I mean, what it is. Human morality is a about. word that always seems a little too yeah. good, but you know what I mean. Yes, of course I do, and that's what we want. And that's, in a certain sense, what you close the book on because you say the end of the worldly philosophers, and that has both the meaning of. They were coming to the end of that, it coming time for something new, and it also means what's the purpose of it all, right? You got it. And that's what we're about. They said it in What's It All About, Alfie, a film at one time. But it's true that we want to get to that, and we need that, and, we're, and that's what we're looking for. Well, I would just like to say at the outset that anybody who's interested in this, and that seems to me the perhaps the one criteria by which we could measure what human purpose and questing is, uh, if, they, if they have that idea of looking for visionary leadership or vision of leadership in terms of fulfilling human purpose, it would be wanting to include the worldly philosophers, and they cannot possibly do better than repairing to the worldly philosophers in order to get a grounding that can give them an understanding of that. And I thank you and congratulate you overwhelmingly on the book. And may the seventh edition that's coming out here in 1999 do even better than the sixth editions that went before. I think it's out coming out in May, I'm not sure. May. And, and for those nice words, I drink to your health. Not at all. Please do. <laughs> and may I just thank you really very, very much Great. for coming into conversations and for all your work. You it's bet. a great pleasure thank and you honor a lot. to talk with you. Thank you. It's been your pleasure to have the perceptions of Professor Robert Halbroner, then a uh, person who's given us a great uh, a book. Let me just show a cover. There will be a more handsome cover in May when the book comes out, but it's called The Worldly Philosophers. And this be the seventh edition of this absolutely essential reading for anyone who wants to try and understand these questions that uh, have so much to do with uh, the important questions that confront mankind. It's The Worldly Philosophers, and as we say, the seventh edition is coming out with a brand new chapter that should be read by one and all. And they do well to pick up on the earlier ones as well in order to get a, a basis of that. So it's been your pleasure to have your perceptions again, Robert Halbroner. Thank you very much for coming in for and all I your thank work. thank you a lot. Not at all. My pleasure. And we invite you to tune in. We'll be coming back again next week. That's it for now. Uh, see you next time. And once again, one more time, thank you very much for <laughs> all the work over the years. Good. Thank you. Thank Until you. next time. So we got that uh, in and... Uh, no, that was good. It's so, it's such a big subject, you know. So it went pretty nicely. Yes, I think it did. I it, mean, it, the only problem being is that there's so much we could talk. Six, we should make a series of what you. Sh you sh have you done a? You've done a great. D you should be on television, and you should be streamed onto the internet, and uh, your perception should be put out into a wider. Uh, you know, have, have you have you thought about doing television? I, I, I've, I've never been asked.